Thank you very much, Mr. Chan. Please be seated. Young Birbahagir, Tansri Rafida Aziz, Chairman of Air Asia X and former Cabinet Minister. Young Birbahagir, Tansri Datuk Sri Utama Arshad Ayub, Chairman of the Board of Directors, University of Malaya. Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba, Awang Mahmud, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, University of Malaya. Associate Professor Dr. Khadija Muhammad Khalid, Executive Director of the International Institute of Public Policy and Management, University of Malaya. Young Birbahagia, Tantri Tantri, Datuk Datuk, Professors, Distinguished Guests, Members of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good morning. On behalf of the International Institute of Public Policy and Management, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to today's 20th public lecture series. As many are aware, this lecture was initially scheduled three weeks ago on the 22nd of August, 2015. However, due to some unforeseen circumstances, the lecture was postponed to today. On behalf of INPUMA, we apologize for any inconveniences caused. On that note, we are particularly heartened to see some guests who showed on the 22nd to come again today. INPUMA is very grateful and thanks you very much for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed to have recently marked the 58th anniversary of Malaysia's independence. Since our Merdeka leaders, we as a nation have made great leaps in our advancement. In less than 60 years, Malaysia has managed to put itself on the map for its economic progress and infrastructure development. Today, we attempt to analyze one of the key reasons for our successes in nation building, and that is the education of our youth. Today's lecture, which will address these important themes of youth and education, will be delivered by none other than former Cabinet Minister Tansri Rafida Aziz. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, may I call upon Dr. Khadija Muhammad Khalid to deliver her welcome remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Rafida Aziz, Chairman of Air Asia X and former Minister of International Trade and, Minis Trade and Industry. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Datuk, Tan Sri Datuk Ashad Ayub, Chairman of um, University of Malaya Board of Directors. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dr. Awang Bugiba Awang Mahmud, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic International. Mr. of Malaya, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good morning. 
on behalf of the International Institute of Public Policy and Management in Puma Institute of Malaya, I would like to bid a very warm welcome to our special guest and speaker of today's public lecture, former Cabinet Minister Tan Sri Rafida Aziz. I also wish to welcome and thank Professor Awang Bugiba Awang Mahmud, Deputy Vice Chancellor, who has kindly accepted Impuma's invitation to introduce the speaker and also later to moderate the session today. Uh, despite his very busy schedule, Professor Awang is supposed to be in Port Dickson this morning. Yeah, UM, um, uh, most of my UM top management, they are there in PD, but I really thank you, Prof Awang, for accommodating us this morning. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge the presence of Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Siti Sa'adya Sheikh Bakir, Director of KPJ Healthcare Berhad. Thank you so much, Tan Sri, for coming. Yeah, she called me up and she said that she, is, she was a student of Tan Sri Rafida. So I welcome you so much, Tan Sri, for be, and thank you for being here. And of course, my former dean, thank you so much, uh, Puan Sri Jahara, yeah, for coming. Yeah, I, I really thank all of you for making time to be with us this morning. Yeah? Actually, I, I'm waiting. We are waiting for a group of students from Ledang. They are still not here. I think they got stuck somewhere. But I think they will join us in time, I hope. Yeah? All right. So I would like to welcome yeah, uh, all of you, and especially um, students from Pusat Asasi Science, yeah, PASOM. And some of them are not here, but they are in that, another hall because actually this hall cannot accommodate everybody. So they are actually in the next hall. Yeah, I would like to also acknowledge students and teachers from Sri Akma School. Are you here? Sri Akma School? All right, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you so much for coming. And also, I would like to welcome and acknowledge the presence of the 92 PTD cadet officers. Where are you? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, um, you are here. And of course, members of the media. I, I know that there's quite a number of you this morning. Okay, thank you so much for coming. And to all our guests, yeah, again, welcome to the Impuma 20th Public Lecture Series. Impuma is indeed very heartened and appreciative of Tansi Rafida's acceptance in delivering a lecture in conjunction with Impuma's 20th Public Lecture Series. Not many people are actually aware that it was Tansi Rafida herself, who was then Minister of International Trade and Industry, who delivered the first lecture to mark the official launch of the Impuma Public Lecture Series on June 15. 2001. Yeah? After 14 years, Tan Sri, we are very pleased to welcome you again to our program to deliver a lecture entitled The Role of Education in the Development of Youth Towards Nation Building. Yeah? This, the, this, the first series was actually um, moderated by none other than the Vice Chancellor, then, Dr. Anwar Zaini. I wish to inform the audience that Tansi Rafida has always been very, very supportive of Impuma activities. In fact, the last time we invited Tansi to University of Malaya was in January 2013, where she delivered a talk on leadership to a relatively small group of people, young aspiring leaders who were part of the Perdana Leader Fellowship, PLF, a program sponsored by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Today, we are delighted to have her back in this August hall to address a much larger crowd many of whom are students from Pusat Asasi Science and several uh, um, from other several faculties in University of Malaya, including Academy Pengajian Islam of University of Malaya. Apart from our students, we have also invited students again, as I mentioned earlier, from a few schools from Ledang. We had a very big program last year, uh, sorry, last week, when we, we went to Tangka in Puma, had a big event there together with KPJ, uh, also, Kementerian Luar Negeri with Maputra, we had a double program which involved 4,000 students last week. And some of the students came to see me and asked me whether they could join to this program. So we actually uh, paid for one bus and the other one paid by the school. So I'm still waiting for them to come, yeah? the two buses from Ledang. So we are very great, grateful that you know today I see many familiar faces in the auditorium with, despite the fact this being a Saturday. We are grateful and applaud you for foregoing your Saturday and instead choosing to be with us this morning. As I mentioned earlier, the first inaugural, uh, the first Impuma Public Lecture was launched in 2001. Over the years, we have had a long list of colourful personalities gracing our lecture series, including Yang Amat Berbahagia Tun Musa Hitam, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak, who was then Defence Minister, 
former High Court Judge Datuk, Sri, uh, Datuk Syed Ahmad Aidit, Syed Abdullah Aidit, scholars such as Professor Donald Horowitz from the Duke University, Kony Yushihara from Kota University, and Hans Tiru from the World Health Organization have all shared their insights and expertise to make our lecture series as extensive as possible. We are delighted and proud for the, for the Impuma Public Lecture Series to have come all the way to its 20th series, and what better way to mark, mark it than the return of our first speaker, Tan Sri Rafida. Throughout its run, the Impuma Public Lecture Series has served many purposes, apart from, pro, uh, from providing a platform to discuss contemporary social, economic, and political issues, it acts as a way for the community of higher education, namely University of Malaya, to interact with the public at large. It also allows for students and people from various professional backgrounds and organizations to network. This program has also served as an occasion to meet as well as re-establish old acquaintances. Like today, I, I've had the privilege to meet Tansri, uh, Ponsri Jahara, who was my dean. And the last time I met her was maybe about five or six years ago. Yeah, so again, I welcome you, uh, Ponsri. For the younger audience, especially students from several secondary schools, from Kuala Lumpur, Selangor, and Johor, as well as those from Pusat Asasi Science, I strongly encourage you to take the initiative to stay updated on current affairs, irrespective of your academic specialization. As students, teachers, and future public officials, PTD officers, you must be well informed on the latest issues and development at the national and international arena. I personally believe our graduates and all the PTD officials today must not only be excellent in their academic specialization and specific tasks and duties, but should be more holistic and global in orientation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the subject of youth has been constantly discussed in our papers and social media. The youth who make up 43% of the total population of the country is one topic that we never get tired of discussing. I must say that our youth these days have been getting a lot of flake lately from being labeled as strawberry generation who are easily bruised, are you? And highly sensitive to being described as unable to look up from their gadgets, yeah? earphones constantly in, the year, in their ears and so on. This is what we all think when we think of the youth today. It's rather unfair, isn't it? I myself like to call them the young and the restless. Sometimes, yeah? As such, Tansi Rafida's lecture today is indeed very timely and relevant, and I'm sure we are all eager to hear her thoughts on this very important topic. Before I end, I would like to once again record my deepest appreciation to Tansi Rafida for accepting our invitation to deliver a public lecture again today. And again, to all of you, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you will have a good day here at University of Malaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Khatija. I would now like to call upon Professor Awang Bulgiba Awang Mahmud Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, to first introduce the speaker and later to moderate the Q&A session. Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Tan Sri Asha Ayub, our LPU Chairman. Uh, Tan Sri Rafida Aziz, our distinguished speaker for today. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. I'm sure we are all excited to be in the presence of Tansri Rafida Aziz, who will deliver a lecture entitled The Role of Education in the Development of Youth Towards Nation Building. Before we begin, allow me to introduce our distinguished speaker, although for for many of us, she does not need any introduction. Tansri Rafida is known to us 
as a very highly competent and industrious cabinet minister. She served for many years in the Ministry of uh, International Trade and Industry, where she served as the, uh, the minister. But uh, it's not the, just the incredible 21 years that she was in Miti. Is that right, Tansri? Is it 21 years? All right, okay. I stand corrected. It is said at that time that she was the very embodiment of the ministry itself. Tansri Rafida Aziz is also a part of the UM family, having served as a tutor and later as a lecturer in the Faculty of Economics and Administration for 10 years, from 1966 to 76. She, did, she graduated from this very same university with a BA in Economics in 1966 and a Master of Economics in 1970. I was made to understand that in 1974, she was appointed as, the, as a senator and of course and then subsequently she resigned as a lecturer from the Faculty of Economics and Administration to contest in the general elections in 1978. Is that correct? No. You know the government. Okay. She was appointed as a parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Public Enterprises, later promoted to Deputy Minister of Finance, and then appointed as Minister of Public Enterprises, a post she had held until 1987. Tansri Rafida served as Member of Parliament for 35 years from 1978 to 2013. She was the MP for the Slayang constituency from 78 to 82, and later the Kuala Kangsa constituency from 82 to 2013. She also served in the AMNO Supreme Council for 38 years, from 1975 to 2013. Throughout her illustrious career, Tansri Rafida's straightforward, non-apologetic views on anything ranging from governance to family values have captured the attention of many, including myself. It is for this very reason that Tansri Rafida is no stranger to the Malaysian public. She was dubbed by the media as Rapid Fire Rafida, Malaysia's Iron Lady, both at home and abroad, for her forthright opinion and wit. Tansri Rafida is indeed not one to mince her words. We are therefore indeed fortunate to have her here today to speak on another topical subject that I am sure will capture the interests of many. Kanri, currently, Tansri Rafida, at a young age of 72, still serves as chairman of Asia, Air Asia X, Mega Steel, and Pinewood Iskandar Malaysia Studios. She's also an adjunct professor at the College of Business in UUM. She has received various awards from all the states of Selangor, Perak, Malacca, Trunganu and Sarawak, as well as accolades from Thailand, Argentina and Chile. Tan Sri Rafida was married to the late Tan Sri Muhammad Basi Ahmad, former chairman of Maybank. Together, they are blessed with three children and five grandchildren. I understand she was an avid golfer, but I'm not sure whether she still plays golf nowadays, and still spends much of her time reading and traveling. With all her exemplary qualities, expertise, and achievements, Tansri Rafida is indeed the ideal person to speak on the role of education of youth in nation building. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I therefore have the singular pleasure of now inviting 
Tansri Rafida Aziz to deliver her lecture. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan salam sejahtera semua. Uh, yang bahagia, Tan Sri Asyik Ayub, very, very old friend, so we are both old. Yang bahagia, Profesor Dr. Awang Bogabi, Bogaba, Bogiba, it's, a, it's a, a joint of two names, that's what I was asking him just now, Bogiba. And Professor, Associate Professor Khadija, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much to Impuma for inviting me once again. I think it's the third time, right? I'm speaking uh, to your members, mostly your members, and I would like to say that, did I look any older from 2001 just now? <laughs> my, my fear was, no, my fear last night was, having come here twice and launched in Puma way back, I was afraid I'd be wearing the same dress. <laughs> <laughs> because I had one misfortune of attending some uh, investment seminar that I led in, in Tokyo, and one Sarawakian, Tycoon had been with the delegation trying to sell timber and whatnot. Then I went to Sarawak to have a domestic seminar there, and the son of this tycoon who, led, who was with his father uh, you know, st stood up and said, I remember you very well. I was with you uh, in Tokyo, and you were wearing the same dress. <laughs> From that day onwards, I shudder to think, did I wear the same dress? I didn't, right? I was actually holding that red dress, you know. So I said, no. Uh, maybe not lah, we're orange today. That's it, baik tidak. Otherwise, people say I'm short, short dresses. And I would like to say thank you once again for inviting me. I'm so sorry to have inconvenience in Puma and also some of you who came the other day because I had to have a really unscheduled surgery. The schedule was 11th August, but I, they had to advance it to 3rd August. I had a, a stomach additions, which is a major surgery. Actually, it's my seventh surgery for the same problem. And I spent five days in CCU and three weeks in the ward. And I had just been discharged, um, well, maybe two weeks ago. And I still have my wounds, which I've been treated every alternate day. So I am happy that I'm able to make it today. But I would not be able to eat a lot. Lah. So that's why I didn't have breakfast just now. Well, you mentioned about uh, you had colorful speakers in the past. Please, I don't want to be a colorful speaker. You know, the word colorful is not very complimentary, you know. Court jesters are colourful, so be careful. Those people that you invited, be careful. Choice of words. You call them distinguished, they'll be very happy. Colourful, no. <laughs> Seriously, I don't want to be a colourful speaker for the wrong reasons. But anyway, I'm happy today that I'm here and you have given me this topic, uh, the role of education in the development of youth towards nation building. And I would like to congratulate uh, University of Malaya especially for allowing others outside of the campus uh, fraternity to be exposed to what you're doing. And I must say that on record, it is our Paungku who led this crusade. Because when I was a lecturer way, way, way back in the early 70s, he once called me and said, Rafida, would you please go and teach Malaysian economics to third year medical students? I said, Paungku, medical students? I mean, Malaysian economics, yes. Uh, you do this for that period that they are in having courses, I don't know how many months was that, and you go to their medical faculty and then tell them about Malaysian economy, talk, tell them about rural economy, so that when they go and serve in the rural areas, they know what they're talking about, they know what to expect. So here I was talking to third-year medical students. Can you imagine? I was very young, and the medical students are you know, maybe older than I, <laughs> or kind of bigger than I. And, and then, at the end of the day, when I went to hospital, especially University Hospital, I mean uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur Hospital, there was a doctor who was doing some procedure on me, urinary tract infection procedure. And nicely, casually says, by the way, Dr. Sri, I was your student before. I clamped up. Here is a doctor doing procedure on me and saying, I'm your student. I actually couldn't recall that I taught this batch of third-year medical students. So when you say that you're exposing this to students uh, and other people outside the fraternity, it's very useful indeed, because we don't want to be uh, regarded as living in ivory tower, you know, shock sendiri among ourselves. So, 
Uh, today, the role of education in development of youth towards nation building. Now, I would like to split this topic into three components so that you can see my trend of thought here. Firstly, that component of nation building. The second one is youth. And the third one, role of education. And I want to begin by talking about nation building first, the last topic, uh, or the last item of the topic first. Now, for Malaysia, essentially, nation building is about post Merdeka. Because before that, we didn't have a nation. We were colonial, uh, we had colonial masters above us. So nation building started post Merdeka. And it was nation building in two contexts, both the physical nation building and the non-physical. Some people talk about nation building only in the physical term, the statistical term, GDP, blah, blah, blah. I would prefer to talk about physical and non-physical, the visible and non-visible. And it is also about unifying our people as Malaysians. That was what nation building started as. And then when we have that nation building as a people, as Malaysians, we can remain, hopefully, both socially and politically viable and also uh, strong over the long term. So that was the essence of nation building post Merdeka. And certainly, when you talk about nation building, if you talk about the physical aspects of nation building, it's got to do with building the necessary infrastructure, which you, of course now you see, and the systems that are being built, whether it's the financial systems, the systems that govern uh, the marketplace and so on. Uh, these systems and infrastructures are there and will continue to be there and to be added on for economic and social development and also for social, economic, and political governance. So that's what the nation building is all about. You cannot have nation building without infrastructure there, the physical infrastructure and the systems infrastructure. And we hope that through that kind of uh, infrastructure building on a continuous basis, starting from the first five-year plan, which I recall very vividly, until now, the 11th and so on, and uh, longer term plans as we have new economic policy and then the industrial master plan that carried on for 10 years, through these plans, purposely designed plans, we hope that the physical infrastructure and systems will continue to be improved so that nation building can be at a higher pace and relevant to what the global environment demands. And as I've said earlier, parallel to that in physical and visible nation building is the non-physical and non-visible nation building that's got to do with the people, with us, the people who are Malaysians. And this has got to do with our values, our norms and attitudes. It's got to do with our mindsets and our perceptions. And it's got to do with the principles that we uphold in our lives. And that, to me, is the most important part of nation building now and for the future. Why? Because the infrastructure build up in terms of physical assets are already there. Just fine-tuning, adding, adding on. But we are having new generations of Malaysians coming now into the system. These are the qualities that we need to preserve and build upon, the non-physical aspects. And I would like to emphasize on the core values and principles that across, uh, cut across every group, every individual, and every race, every creed. In other words, every level of strata and strata of society. The same core principles must exist. The same threads must exist. And these are, for example, every core value and principle that can be translated into governing of social units such as families, governing organizations, governing politics, governing businesses, governing universities, governing education systems. Now, if the same core values are pervasive, we are set to be the kind of nation that all of us can be proud of for the future. For example, every one of us have our own circle of influence. Uh, sometimes we tend to forget. We look upstairs and say, ah, he. He, there, up there, the power, the leader. I said, no. We all have our own circles of influence. Break down all the titles. What are you, basically? You are a son or a daughter. So your circle of influence are your siblings. If you are a father or mother, then your circle of influence is your whole family. If you are a teacher, your immediate circle of influence is from your family, you extend to the classroom. If you are a lecturer, then extend to the unit. So in other words, Everybody has a circle of influence. So when I talk about core values and principles pervasive across every strata of society, it means that it doesn't matter what you are, whether you're prime minister or you're just anybody, or even uh, uh, somebody who has no job, you know, a lady of leisure or a man of leisure retired, like me, I'm a lady of leisure, okay, I'm retired. 
not that living leisurely life, but retired. Of course, uh, Tan Si Asha Ayub can be called a retiree also, but very active retiree, the two of us. Still, our circles influence are still there, right? So if you take, uh, you take cognizance of these circles of influence, you must remember the core values must prevail because this is the non-physical aspect of nation building. Now, what are the values I'm talking about? Uh, this is relevant to these current times that's uh, causing a lot of disturbance for us. Last night, I gave a two-hour talk and dialogue session to the Ivy League students about this. One is integrity and trustworthiness. I personally place a high premium on integrity and trustworthiness. If you don't have integrity and don't have trustworthiness, please don't talk. Don't talk. I don't care what you say. If there is nothing that proves that you have integrity and trustworthiness. Because to me, integrity and trustworthiness is the key to everything. It's the key to decision making anywhere for that matter. Decision making in the home, in the university, decision making in school, decision making at education ministry, decision making in government, in cabinet. No integrity, no trustworthiness, you make the wrong decisions. It is also the key to motivation. If you don't have integrity, you're not motivated to do the right thing. It is the key to action. If you're not motivated, you don't have integrity, then you won't do the right thing, for sure. Because there's nothing to pull your conscience, doesn't prick you. So in any situation in life, integrity and trustworthiness is key. We can talk about it later, but what you're asking, but I'm just saying that is key to everything as far as I'm concerned. Secondly is discipline. If you don't have discipline, it's very difficult. If you want to have a nation that is strong, a nation that's uh, where the people are strong and have the kind of right motivation, of course, high integrity, but they're not disciplined, they go haywire. It's of, of course, not much use. You may be the right, very straight, ramrod, straight, but you're not disciplined. You don't know how to manage your time. You don't even know how to manage yourself. You don't even know how to manage people. So you may be the best CEO, you may be the best of everything, but you can't manage because you don't have the discipline. The third one is responsibility. This is responsibility for yourself, responsibility for decisions and actions that you take, and also responsibility for society. This is about civic uh, responsibility. And it includes also respect for yourself and for others. Just now, Khadija talked about a strawberry. This is the first time I'm hearing. Uh, strawberry ni means what? I don't know. What do you mean? Uh, huh? uh, strawberry easily bruised? I think mangoes are easily bruised. I don't care what you call yourself, but if you don't have integrity, you're very easily bruised. Lah. If you don't have discipline, you'll be very easily bruised. Call yourself strawberry or raspberry, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? If you don't have those qualities, you will be easily bruised. In fact, you bruise yourself if you don't have integrity, correct? You don't have discipline. People have, don't, don't have to bruise you. You bruise yourself because you're doing the wrong things. So when you talk about responsibility in Malaysia and respect, it is in the context of the Malaysian diversity. I can't speak enough about this. Last night, I went on and on. For example, we've been told ex, uh, to tolerate our diversity uh, since I was young. And I keep saying that's the wrong word to use. Never ask people to tolerate diversity, to accept diversity. It's there. Tolerate means, you know, for as long as I can tolerate you, it's like marriage, you know. When you're all in love, you tolerate each other's nonsense. Come, another spring chicken comes your way and you don't tolerate anymore. The slightest thing will cause friction, correct? But if you accept, you know. He's got a wart in his nose, he's got some funny behaviour, she's got some funny uh, quirks. You accept it. So you live life together till death do us part. You understand what I'm trying to say between tolerance and acceptance? So next time some politician tells you, let's accept our tolerance, you please stand up and say, excuse me sir or madam. Accept the tolerance. For as long as you just learn to tolerate, this is what's going to happen. Yellow shirt against red shirt, and very soon it'll be purple against green and what have you. <laughs> we have, still have a lot of colours, you know. On the rainbow, there's seven colours. We don't know some crazy idiots will come up with a purple colour. Pula. I don't know what they want to stand for. Because I can't tolerate the red, I cannot tolerate the yellow, so I want to come with my own purple. <laughs> Alright? So... It is simple. Acceptance that comes with the respect is because we know we are different in terms of religion, culture, creed, so many differences. But we don't have to harp on the differences, accept that as being the norm of Malaysia. And once we accept it, we then 
accept and respect the differences. And this the young, the youth will have to learn. My era, Tan Sri Asha's era, we didn't recognize Chinese or Indian. You know, my, my mother and father, they go to the shop and they call them, you know, Anjang. Look at the tall Chinese shopkeeper. Mana ada beli shopkeeper dulu? Anjang, Gumo. And we call them by nicknames. And they call us by nicknames because they're such good friends. You know, I mean, we didn't realize that they were Chinese or Indian or we were Malay. So we're just customer and shopkeeper and we're friends. Beli utang pula tu. Utang. I know, I was the one who writes in the little tiga, tiga, pukul tiga lima, no, berapa beli, beli beras hari ni. Anjang berapa? I would say Anjang. Yeah, yeah, tall. But we call him Anjang. What can I do? I don't want Uncle Anjang. Anjang lah. I was only standard two, standard three. Anjang, gumok macam mana? Berapa? Satu kati gula? No kilo. No. So in other words, that was a culture we were brought up in. And today, you have people really identifying themselves very narrowly. Uh, I, last night, I explained to the Ivy League students, I said, you know, for my own practice at home, I tested on my grandchildren, my youngest grandchild, 10 years old. I wanted to see whether in their school, uh, they have this exposure to this diversity and acceptance diversity. So I asked, uh, uh, Aiden, do you have many friends in school? Yeah, I have many friends. Uh, who are they? I didn't say, are they Chinese? I didn't say, they're Indian. Ask questions like that, you're putting the wrong, wrong kind of seats in the heads. I just ask, who are your friends? What are their names? So they quote like Eugene lah, Krishnan lah. The only thing I, he didn't quote was a girl's name. <laughs> Ten year old, you know. They are very conscious of this. Uh, you don't have any friends who are girls? Shyly say, no. Kalau macam itu, tu ada lah tu kan? Uh, Sophia, kapa ada lah, but too shy to mention kan? Grandma kata, oh you got a girlfriend at 10 years old. But the fact that he mentioned and rattled off all these multiracial names, I was so happy. Wow, my grandson doesn't recognize uh, races. Those are his friends because that's how we were brought up. And this is what I would like for all of you to do. Those of you who are about to set up families, do not go and plant, eh, kawan Melayu ke? Eh, your Chinese friends ah? Are you Indian friends? Are you? That's how we divide ourselves. And teachers, for example, stop planting this kind of ideas. Hey, this Muslim, non-Muslim, you, you go and eat in his house, and non-Muslim. I mean, we went to non-Muslims' homes. They don't serve us pork, for heaven's sake. Their mothers knew. They serve us neutral food. They don't even cook the food in their house. They go and buy makcik somewhere nasi lemak or what. You know, if I were to go to the house for lunch. No, they respected the religion. They don't have to be told, yeah, I don't take pork, you know, no need. I know if I went to my Chinese friend's house, for sure there's no anything that's uh, offensive to my religion. And of course, if they know there's a Hindu friend, very staunch Hindu friend who came, classmate, for sure there's no beef for her. There'll be something else, not beef lah, for the rest of us are beef, kan? That's how it was, automatic respect. Now that is what nation building is all about. Not the figures and GDP. I'll tell you why I, I'm adverse to this, just figures and statistics. Without that, there is no nation. It's just mortar and bricks. And nothing in terms of spirit. You know, you were singing two songs just now. Didn't you feel the songs? Did, did, did the song ever say, uh, China, China, Melayu, India, ada? <laughs> ada ke? In any of the songs, ada tak? Did it talk about Perdana Menteri, Timbalan Perdana Menteri ada tak? Tak ada. Dia kata Malaysia. Correct? It didn't say support A, support B ada. Sejahteralah PM, dia kata ada. Ada dia kata sejahteralah VC ada. Ada dia kata sejahteralah Rafidah Aziz ada. Tak ada sejahtera Malaysia. I cannot follow your... Mana dia menyanyi tadi? Haa? Oh, his voice, very good. <laughs> of course, I have an excuse. Baru operate, so cannot breathe. <laughs> you see, if you look at these songs that really uh, raise our patriotism, it doesn't say about race or creed, you know. It talks about Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaysia. And yet, why are we introducing all these extraneous elements that divide us, that causes chasms unnecessarily? Why? I don't understand. I really don't understand. But I'm sure we must begin to stop this nonsense.
That's all I'm asking to the use of today. Maybe the ones before you are a bit degil already, dah jadi buluh kan, susah nak ni. You are still the rebung. Nurture your children, nurture your siblings in the way that we were nurtured, we the oldies, that now are leaving this nation to you as the people taking over. Another uh, core principle is loyalty. Loyalty is to nation. There's no such thing as loyalty to anyone. I remember I was at a dinner with Tun Mahade, with a few other people, 10 at the table. Tan Sri Azman Hashim was there. And he was talking about Dola Badawi, you know, at that time, trying to choose his deputy. And Mahade said, uh, you know, Dola has to choose someone loyal to him, you know. And I said, Tun, I don't agree with you. And of course, my voice is not very, low, uh, very soft, right? Across the table, Tun, I don't agree with you. You shouldn't choose your deputy who's loyal to you. You should choose someone who's loyal to the nation. You know, Datun, I agree. I, I, I support you very strongly, not because you're Mahdi, you know. You are a good leader that led this nation so far ahead. That's why I support you. Because your loyalty to the nation is uh, undoubted. I am loyal to the nation, so I support you. You could see Tansi Azman Hashim's eyes widen. How could she say this? And this was at a bhakti function like that. And the others just get quiet. Because to me, loyalty is not to a person. It's to this nation of ours. Now, if people can be separate that, we will have better nation building than image building of individuals. And goes to your university too, you're not loyal to the VC. Not loyal to chairman of the board, right? If good chairman of the board, we are loyal because he's loyal to the university. You see how it is, the vicarious loyalty? But some people are so short-sighted. Of course, if you get your soru from that value, then easier. Lah. <laughs> Please, let's be frank about this. Loyalty to nation first. And I tell you, I am nationalistic in that context. My nation, don't you ever say anything that's uh, adverse to my nation, to my country. I'll be the first to lash out. I don't care who you are. If you want to curse individuals who are not doing right, that's your right. But don't ever talk bad about my nation. Not that it's perfect, it's not, but we will explain why it's not perfect. If our growth is below par, why? We must know why, right? Not because there is lack of confidence in the nation, not because there's no governance, and that we cannot forgive. But the thing is, be loyal to your country. That's first. Malaysia, many of you are Malaysia. You're proud to be a Malay, so am I. But I'm a Malaysian first. Now, why do I say that? Is there a Malay country in the world? I ask you, is there a Malay country? If you were to go, if I were to go somewhere, people don't recognize me, let's say, I'm a non-entity. Uh, where are you from, madam? Uh, I'm a Malay. <laughs> uh, where? South Africa? Cape Town, kan? Cambodia? Kampung Cham, Malays. Brunei, Singapore, Indonesia, all Malays. I am a Malaysian, but I happen to be from the Malay stock. Okay, if you're a Chinese, Lim. Katalah ada Lim kat sini. Ah, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Chinese. Oh, where is which part? Shanghai? Guangzhou? No, no, I'm from Malaysia. Then why don't you start by saying, I'm Lim from Malaysia? Why do you want to... Emphasize your Malayness, your Chineseness, your Indianness. Okay, somebody Indian, Black Krishnan. Uh, from Bangalore, are you? No, no, no. I'm from Tanjung Malim, Malaysia. <laughs> so why, why, why not project your Malaysianness? Correct. So begin to do that. I know politically some people don't want. I'm a Malay first. I said, Madam, gaya wak. Tanah Melayu dah tak ada. It's Malaysia now. Why did we have Malaysia? Because we recognize that. This belongs to a whole uh, nation of diverse people. Sabah, Sarawak dah masuk. So, be Malaysian first. But be proud to be a successful Malay, successful Malay, successful Chinese, successful Iban. Be proud. Because that's your heritage. But you're more proud of your country, right? The first Malaysian to go to, to, the, uh, to the space, the first Malaysian. It's so membanggakan. I don't know how to use that word. You know, every time I read, this Malaysian. I don't care. I don't even care about the race. 
First Malaysian, wow, it gives you that. I don't know, uh, Tan Sri, I'm sure you agree, right? When we read, we oldies are like that, and you know, we become tearful very quickly. Wow, the First Malaysian, oh, it's like my own daughter, lah, like my own son, you know, getting that award. Actually, I don't even know them from Adam. But of course, alternatively, on the converse, I am so sad and want to eat up people when I see the First Malaysian uh, being caught for pedophile. You know? You, oh, I will kill him. You know that kind of spirit. Why cuma the image of my country? Correct? That, that's what I'm trying to impress upon you. There's nothing wrong with saying I'm a Malaysian. And I'm proud to be a Malaysian of the Malay stock, the Chinese stock. Because some of you, your grandparents came from China. My grand, great-grandparents came from Sumatra. I don't know where they were in Sumatra. I don't care. I'm a Malaysia, tanah tumpah darahku kan? Not tanah tumpah darahku, May 13. <laughs> tanah tumpah darahku is a Malay we say of saying when we were given birth by our parents, the water bag burst and a lot of blood came out. That's what it meant, tanah, tanah tumpah darah. Not carrying some craze or some sword, killing others. That's not tanah tumpah darah. Yeah, that's a murderer's. Tanah tumpah darah means we were born here, given birth to. That's what it meant. So please, when you talk about loyalty to the nation, so that you remember that once you were beneficiaries of development, all of you, now your turn has come to be contributors to development. I was beneficiary of the colonial government. We had no government then. But I contribute to our own independent country's government. Now I'm retired. So R&D, innovation, being spearheaded by Malaysians in any field. And we're seeing that now. Although these people don't get much uh, apa namanya, uh, media coverage, because you know, who wants, who's interested in them, better interested in whose shirts is wearing what. But uh, some of these people in medical area have got the latest technology, latest techniques being applied. And they're Malaysians. They've been quoted globally for their expertise. That is what it's all about, nation building. And certainly, ladies and gentlemen, when you have the right core values pervasive throughout any circle of influence of an individual, it will result in the motivation and drive to succeed. It will result in eventually good public governance. So if the person rises up to the top of public governance, he or she becomes good administrators and good governors of the country, good social behavior, and also you become socially responsible business entrepreneurs. So you're not going to be CEOs who cheat your company, CEOs who cut corners and cheat the public, cheat consumers. You'll be having good social responsibility in the marketplace. So in other words, nation building is about all this coming together so that people avoid becoming liabilities to the nation, yeah? the physical aspects. So when you talk about groups, I mentioned just now, parents, you nurture your children right, for sure, assets to the nation. And today, it's a very difficult thing to do because parents seem not to nurture children. It's the babies who are nurturing the children, <laughs> right? The children wait for three weeks on some conference or other. The children will get sick and have fever when the baby goes home for three weeks to their hometown in, in, the, in uh, Indonesia somewhere, correct or not? It tells you that parents are not nurturing hands-on. You go to some restaurant, to see parents, the younger ones, because I have two babies, you know, and three small children. So the two babies will be holding the two children and feeding the two children. And of course, this couple will be chatting away about like, today's politics, you know. And the children will be fed by the... That is a status symbol nowadays. To question anyway. Doing, because we, we were seeing that they're doing the right thing. So now, this young generation is shaping the marketplace for now and the future. This is the characteristics. So, since you cannot withhold knowledge from them, and they are all ICT savvy, and they get information all online in real time, so the education process and the process of interacting to account what their needs are. Lessons, things getting out of date, happens very fast now. Even in IT, right? Apple comes up every year with something new. Don't talk applications. What was not before has now overtake, been overtaken by something new. So because obsol obsolescence is the order of the day globally, our youth must be reminded, don't stay in a rut. 
Of course, our, our leaders will say, don't stay in your comfort zone. Move out of your comfort zone. You're nodding to say so? Wrong. How can you tell the young people to move out of their comfort zone? No person in their right mind will want to go out. There must be idiots out there who want to do that. I won't. If I'm comfortable, you're telling me to move out of my comfort zone and go into what? Into a rut? You don't give an option. The young wants an option, all right? So if you can provide access opportunities for a higher level of comfort zone, every young person will rush for it, right? Betul tidak? So that's it. How we even nurture the minds of our young is so important. And then this quote all the foreigners, think out of the box. I said, what stupid box are you all living in? I don't know about the writers of books must be living in some boxes. I don't know. I don't remember. I lived in a very small kampung house. It's hardly a box. But we rattle off. Think out of the box. I said, which stupid box are you living in? At least our old generation before understood what they're talking about. They said, do not be the frog under the frog shell, under the coconut shell, right? Why? Because in the kampong, whenever we cut the coconuts into two, and this coconut ni, we pile up. It's a habit like in the kampong, because later on, we want to make into lamps, we want to make into all kinds of things, you know, this coconut shell. We don't throw them away, recycle. We were into recycling long before the word came into vogue. So all these coconut shells before you kuko, you know kuko, there's no machine, you kuko, scrape. So you pile them up very high, somewhere near the pokok pisang. And of some stupid frog jump and jump. And then one coconut shell fall on it. So the frog is under the coconut shell. And for a long time, unless it got out of the shell, its life, its world was a coconut shell. So don't let me like kata under the coconut shell. Like you don't know anything else. You jump, coconut shell come with you. You jump. Unless you jump high enough and throw off the shell. So the old people observe that. So they said, don't be like a frog under the coconut shell. You don't see anything else. No, but this foreigner said, don't take out of the box. Box mana ni? Why not we positively say, look at the broader horizon. Right? Think beyond your own sphere. I mean, positively tell them, you know, what you have here, like University Malaya lah. Think beyond University Malaya, right? Think global universities, if not regional. What number are you now ranking? You want to tell or not? <laughs> ah. So if you talk about yourself among Malaysia universities, maybe lah number berapa? Kan, number satu lah kan? Among Malaysia universities. Look at your competitors, apa? What I'm saying is, look regional. Do you rank still number one? No. Rank global, I hate to say. Masuk book tak? Huh? 155 must be page 62. We want to be the first page of ranking. Buka aja that we are right. If I have to go through so many pages, where is number 155? Tak payahlah. You want to be the top quadrant 20, not the last quadrant 20. Oh dear. You see? You understand what I'm trying to impress on you now? So stop this out of the box thinking. I don't, if people tell you, I say, I don't know, I don't live in a box. And stop this about comfort zone. You go to higher comfort zone. You must always recognize. Don't be complacent. There's always a better comfort zone that you can aspire to if you want to. If you don't want to, never mind. Lah. You stay put where you are if you're comfortable. Who, who cares, right? But I'm sure as somebody proud of your own achievements and your capabilities, you'll want to aspire for better. That's what I think. As at 72, I can go, as, I can now sleep in, you know, why should I be here talking to you? Saturday, remember Khadija? Don't thank them, thank me. 72 and thank Tan Sri Yashat. We have all 70s, 80s. You should be sleeping in. We deserve our rest, right? I just came out of hospital. I should be snug under my duvet now. Ha. Ni baru nak bangun geliat-geliat ni baru. And yet she makes me come at 9.45 to be at the gate. Why? Because to me, talking to you is enriching for me because afterwards there will be Q&A and you will be asking me. I have a choice. 
They be comfortable under my blanket or duvet or come here and be enriched in my mind. It wouldn't actually make go, me go higher in my comfort zone. It caused me discomfort, you know, like I'm sweating now. <laughs> huh? But mindset is being enriched. So this is how you should think. And performance benchmarks continue to be global. Again, I want to emphasize, with global benchmarks, it means that the benchmarks for excellence keep going higher and higher. This is what all of you should aspire for, the youth of today. And so, summing up there on that uh, youth aspect, the human resource is undoubtedly the key to the nation's progress for now and the future. No doubt about it. You talk to me about robots. I said the human must make the robot. The human must program the robot, right? The robot doesn't program itself. So without the human, nothing happens. Without the human, no ICT. Without the human, no social media. In other words, you, the human, is a key to everything. So when you talk about youth, you are in fact the population segment. That's the main drivers of our country's growth for the future. So I spoke about uh, the nation building. I spoke about youth. Now let me go to education. There are to me four assets, four facets rather, to education. One is the system, second structure, third strategies, and fourth is outcomes or goals. That's the way I, I see it. I don't care about blue, blue book, second green book or green print or blueprint. I don't know. I don't read. Uh, I, I, I think about practical. Uh. So for me, education is system, structure, strategies, outcomes, and goals. First, rule of this country or any country, never politicize education. Never politicize education. <laughs> never use education to get votes from anyone. Never use education as a subject matter to speak to any gallery. Our problem has been this. I had the misfortune of having to teach for 10 years what I call the lost generation of Malays who were not taught in any medium of English anything at all. By the time they came to my class, I had to have a special class of 300 plus Malays only for them. Can you imagine? I had 1,169 students in the first year. My class was open to engineering, to agriculture, and to science, or to medical third year. Then I had 350 plus Malay students who didn't understand English. Then I had the rest, 700 plus English speaking. Some Malay, some non Malay. So I had three classes because there was no place until the DTC was constructed for me to teach. So I had to teach like this one in lecture theatre A, economics, the other one lecture theatre C through video. Of course, they all didn't like it because they couldn't see me. They only heard me and saw me on the screen. They said they couldn't touch me. They were all joking, you know. And then uh, the Malay who didn't understand English, I had to have another class. Three times. Teach the same subject. I could vomit out, you know, what I taught after the second time already, let alone third time. That was a lost generation. When they went to the government service, uh, they were so lost. They went to private sector. Forget it. Like, the private sector had nothing good to say. So don't repeat that lost generation situation in Malaysia ever, ever again. Let our young people, regardless of race, be conversant in universal language like English. There is no erosion of pride and nationalism understanding English. I can speak English and Malay in the same breath and make people understood. No problem, I can switch. If I could, I would also speak French, but none of you speak French. I also forgot my French. I took French as one subject in university for my final year, mind you. Nine economics, one French. Thank God I got a B. Otherwise, I would flopped the whole exam. <laughs> what I'm saying is that that national interest says, dictates that we must be conversant on par with the rest. I always wondered, why do you think Lee Kuan Yew made Malay the national language of Singapore? when Singapore had only this many Malays, correct? Very simple reason. He understood that eventually this region will be a region where Malay is a main language. You have Indonesians speaking Malay. This is conversation Malay, lah, not knowledge Malay. Uh, Malaysia, you have Brunei, right? 
some parts of Thailand as well, and then the new countries, you know, they are some Malay, uh, Cambodia. So he, he understood if Malay, young uh, Singaporeans can understand Malay, communicating with their counterparts in ASEAN is easy. But for official and all that, English is the mainstay in office understanding of each other. That's why. That's why. So you don't lose your Chinese-ness, your Malayness or whatever by learning English and understanding English. So that it can help you to be more productive. It can help you understand new knowledge. You know, some people told me early days, what's the problem? We have, inter we have translators. Can translate all the books into Malay. Oh my God. By the time we finish translating, a new book would have come up to debunk the old theory. Correct? By the time you go into print, it's already new ideas. See how, and those were the days when I was arguing. Lah. Why do we do this 10 years of lost generation? Why? I was very vocal. But I was shot down. We have translation, we have down bahasa and what have you. Okay, go and have your way. I didn't care. When I came into government in my ministry, I had every Friday English classes. English classes. And I told the Prime Minister, Tun Mahathir, I don't care what the policy of the government is in terms of correspondence internally. In my ministry, it shall be English. Because we have to interface with the private sector. We have to interface with the world in our negotiations and so on. I cannot afford to have my staff, whether Chinese or Malay or Indian, very well versed in Malay. Bahasa, even the Chinese are speaking very good Malay, you know. Don't forget, Jawi pun dia pandai. So I don't want our young Malaysians to be able and proficient to speak in English, uh, Malay, and when they are facing the non, I mean the foreigners, they're stuck. They're stuck. They can understand. They cannot answer balik. You know, they can't uh, respond. And how do you argue in negotiations when you can't respond? Wow, how? You can't do it in Malay with the translation, right? So I said, sir, you give me dispensation. I got it. He understood very well. He gave me dispensation. Yes, Miti can have all correspondence in English up to today. And of course, the first few memos I got from senior officers were full of mistakes that I didn't know whether to cry or laugh. There was a memo that says, the bench making, benchmarking, <laughs> Either it's a typo. It can't be a typo. That kind of officer didn't check, right? I said, which benches are you making? And, <laughs> and uh, is it with some tables as well? And of course, they look at me blankly. What is she talking about? <laughs> but the classic one is warehouse. W-H-E-R-E, house. <laughs> and I said, thank God the typist didn't put O. All those who understood English laugh like you did. Because I'm a very happy minister, and all my friends, all my students. So we had a good laugh and roar. But this guy who presented the paper looked puzzled. Why are you laughing? I said, if you put the, your typist or you put O there, you know what it is? Prostitute house. Kan brothel, they tak paham. Brothel is another big word. Prostitute, they paham. Prostitute house, you know. Whole house. Now you got warehouse, W-H-E-R-E. -E. And those were the initial trauma of receiving memos in English. And I spent time correcting the English rather than the substance dulu. But thank God, after this every week of English, and of course the lecturer came to me, Rafida, your, the English of your staff is atrocious. I said, why do you think I called you for free? You know? <laughs> for free, kawan. And of course, love for the nation lah ni took time off Friday from her own lectures to teach English. Why do you think I called you? Because it is atrocious. But now we have people who are, you know, throw them anywhere. They will be able to negotiate and uh, say what they want to say and make their point for the country. For the country, not to show off their English. To make the point for the country so that we don't get out-negotiated unnecessarily. Uh, that's what I mean. And so, education must be never politicized so that we can have this the system for example the system must be of global relevance while still having domestic uh, 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 factors 
We must have continued emphasis on English. I don't care what others say. You must have emphasis in the system to meet market demands and requirements of our country moving forward. You must instill a, a sense of pride through that English knowledge and through the education system of achieving something that's globally benchmark. So can that system can create the kind of environment suitable for innovation because we are innovation driven country soon and a system of education that allows for the narrowing of divides among schools. Now you have schools that be study, then schools that are not be study. I pity those parents whose children are not be study schools. How would you feel? I was in Kuala Kangsa for 31 years, as mentioned by Prof just now. I had to deal with these rural schools and the Tamil schools, poor schools, estate schools, Chinese schools, private schools. There was a building condemned by JKR when I went to visit. And then they said, this one condemned by JKR. Then why are you still here? Because nowhere to go. We, are, we don't get money from government, you know. We, o we only uh, get charity. I raised 400,000 for them to build a new extension. I said, I do not want to have on my head this building crashing down on staff, on students. I mean, that's how it is, the chasm. All of you see only these nice schools in town, right? Go back to your own kampong and see. So we don't want a system that has chasms and disparities between and among schools. And of course, access to good education. We must have uniform access accessibility. And a system of education that allows for the nurturing of the young, not just education. Education must include nurturing. And structure. The structure of the education system must be such that those being educated are in, imbibed with the necessary skills. First of all, analytical skills. Don't study by rote. Don't study by rote. That's the worst kind. Analytical skills, rationalization of skills, to understand reason. That's how we were educated at Tan Sri. Remember? The English, they drummed into us because we had English masters, English uh, headmistresses, you know, they drummed into us. Analytical skills, rationalization skills. And this will straight away complement the IT savviness of the Gen Y, Gen Z. They already have the tools. So you provide them in the school system with a thinking process. So that together with what tools they have, they apply, they become brilliant. They become people who can actually develop and innovate. And of course, when you have uh, schools and education system that needs to nurture the young, you must have a continuous thread of nurturing from primary school to secondary school to tertiary school, or even up to university, the thread of nurturing. Nurturing is not reading and understanding books. Nurturing is what I talked about just now. National pride, all that. That's what I mean, the nurturing part. It's not about, uh, okay, curriculum A, B, C, D. That's only one part, that's education. Education plus nurturing, that's what we need now, most of all. And the next one is strategies. Here, we must make sure that the strategies we use in imparting education and nurturing tallies with what the young generation of today and the future understand, which is the ICT savvy. I, I mentioned that earlier. And to me here, teacher training is crucial. Because without the right kind of teachers being churned out to go and teach in schools, how do you expect any new movements forward? If the teacher training curriculum is not based on ICT, if it is not meant to be interfacing with young people, I don't know, I haven't looked at the teacher training curriculum, but I'm sure there's something wrong there. I was at the, at the hospital yesterday getting my wound dress, sat next to a lady, she, uh, she, she recognized me, hardly came next to me. I asked her, where are you from? Because normally these people are from outside, you know, I just met a couple from Kuantan, so I asked her in that context, lah, are you from KL or are you from outside? Seeing this specialist, oh, I'm from KL, I need teacher biasa je. Wow. Can you imagine? I gave her a lecture there and then. Forget about this being in a clinic or a hospital. What are you talking? I, I just met her for the first time, you know. What are you talking about, teacher biasa saya? You know that your role is very, very important. You teach the wrong things to the children in your school. They are finished. 
your job is the most important. In Sweden, the teaching profession is number one. It is so difficult to be a teacher. Thousands apply. They select the best to be teachers. It is not a residual vocation. It's not a teacher aja. In Sweden, in the Scandinavian countries, I am a teacher. Not I am a politician. No. I am a ketua bahagian. No. But kat sini, I, I lecture to her lah. But she didn't take offense because I lecture in a nice way. You know, you first timers, you don't scream at them lah. <laughs> and I could see that she was moved by that. We said, I was a teacher for 10 years in the university. I tried my best. Still, I get some people who didn't. Your ex-deputy prime minister, Mahyudin, was my student. Yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he was my student. I don't know whether I taught him well or not. <laughs> so, no, so was Anwar Ibrahim. That was a misfit. I got guessed by tear guests so many times trying to enter my lecture theatre because of him and them running around with Shamudin Ra'is and what have you. And the tear guests thrown in, I couldn't get in or out. It was one of those. Then Rahim Tambichi, the father, Jahara, Saadia, two of them here. Tansris, Tansris. All in their own rights, not because they're husband, but on their own right. Uh, former KSNs. I mean, I'm old, I'm 72. So you do expect the students of mine, right? Now, what I'm trying to say is that if you, I think myself, Allah, I lecture je. Wow, I don't have much care for myself, right? No respect for myself, no respect for my job. So for this girl, I had to nicely tell her, yours is the most important job of all. Before these children go out further into the life, you, what you teach them, not what you teach them in terms of books. I kata ajaran. So I lecture like this lah. I mini lecture at the, at the clinic. And she seemed to absorb what I say. She took photograph and selfie with me at the end. So it's okay. <laughs> that was my benchmark. Can I have a selfie with you? Peluk I. Okay, that means it's okay lah. She wasn't uh, hurt. You know, if she walked away, that means she was hurt lah. But she decided to have a selfie. And then another fellow heard what I was saying, came by. You are Ravida Aziz, can I have another selfie? Good. We have selfie in the hospital. So, teacher training is so important. Teachers must be taught how to interface with Gen Y and Gen Z and whatever coming. Otherwise, there will be disparity between the teachers and the students. And the education will never be complete. And, of course, there must be dis uh, dis uh, minimal disparities between the strategies that we teach and nurture in private schools and in government schools. There seems to be disparity now. People are taking out and sacrificing money to send children to private school because they think they're nurturing done. So they must watch out that this is not there. And outcomes and goals. This should be beyond purely the academic in terms of academic performance. I don't care how many A's my children get. I don't care how many A's my grandchildren get. It's not a reflection of them. It's whether false or right, true or false, right? Choose A, B, C. Kadang dia tutup mata, eh betul. It's how they turn out to be. Of course, understanding is very good. What I'm saying is that if you only guide by that, abeh lah. There must be a lot more benchmarking of success. And therefore, when we have about nation building, the outcome should be what you produce from the education system are those who can fit in into the nation and the nation's aspirations. Tak apa, tak apa. No, no, no. I do one. Sekarang dia matah. I will ask. Thank you. Thank you very much for your concern, Prof. See, very chivalrous. <laughs> and the education uh, system in this country must be well ahead of the market demands. We seem to be doing catch up. We should be preempting market demands so that when the time comes, we are ready. I know, as a minister, I kept being asked. Uh, are you able to churn out so many engineers? Are you able to churn out so many IT programmers? I couldn't answer because we didn't have at that time the kind of statistics. Now ada lah, but I'm not sure whether they are the right kind. You can be an engineer, but the right kind must be, right? Not, not just any engineer, right? Today, you have an engineer that's got, in, got the bio engineering, right, Prof? Correct? Right? No longer just civil as such. 
the branches are so specialized now. So are we churning out these people? Engineers who understand intelligent buildings, who understand the use of eco-friendly materials, for example, eco-friendly processes. So if in the university this is not being taught and being made recogni being recognized by students, they're not going to be all around the engineers or anything for that matter. So we have therefore to make sure that the education outcomes and goals fit in with the national objectives. And this is so important to be monitored all the time. I don't know who's monitoring this. We keep launching so many reports. We keep launching so many books. I'm not sure whether the monitoring is done properly. We still see a lot of problems. So, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is that education must incorporate nurturing. And I've, I've talked a lot about what nurturing is, so, and upbringing. Uh, that I see as the meaning of education. So that, at the end of the day, the youth will understand their roles in nation building, they understand what is nation building, and they understand that they should be assets to the nation, not liabilities. Of course, that's a cliche, but I have to repeat. Don't be assets. Last night, one girl asked me, one of the Ivy League graduates, you know, oh, now, you know, we have politicians who have issues, you know, blah, 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 blah. What do, you, what, what do you think? I said, the most important thing is for ourselves not to be issues. You should not be an issue. I should not be an issue. Don't talk about politicians, you know, we ourselves can be issues in our own situations, right? You can be an issue as a student. I had issues with students, right? I told you about the tear gas. Don't look at politicians having issues. You, if you are the CEO of a company, don't be an issue. You must have corporate governance. So, diam lah dia. It's always there, that fellow, when you have four fingers pointing at you. Ah, this is what I'm trying to say. You, all of us have our own little role, even the little finger back pointing at us. So, I hope that we all love our country, and really, when we sing Negaraku, we sing Sahati Sejiwa, we mean it. Lah. Yeah, we mean it, not just lip service. Lip sync, they call it. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to sit here? Actually, I'm going to stand up. No. Because... Uh, public speaking means you must be able to see eye to eye. And if I have to sit so low and look at like that, I mean, you are going to overwhelm me. No, no, seriously, I prefer to stand because my stomach cannot take sitting up too long. So I'll okay. stand with you, Tashri. No, 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 you no, 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 it's okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm 20 years younger. That age is not, doesn't count. Oh, no, age doesn't count. So it's thank here. you very much, Tashri, for a very uh, inspiring lecture. I think we've... Uh, We've, we've heard uh, from uh, Tansri Rafida the, the importance of nurturing, the importance of having a good system of education. Incidentally, it's not just the world out there who will benefit or not benefit from, from a good education system, but we in the universities are also the recipients of, of students from, uh, from schools. Yeah. Now, um, uh, before, before we take uh, questions, I think Tansri will, would love to take questions from the floor. Uh, could I ask that anyone who wants to pose a question, please just identify yourself and uh, say very clearly. And please don't have a very long-winded question. So straight to the point, so that Tansri can uh, then uh, reply. I tell you what, I sympathize with you, I'll sit down. This, 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 this. Come, Tansri. <laughs> Although it's more comfortable standing, but never mind. <laughs> I defer to the man. <laughs> Young to him, maybe. Okay, first question. Lama-lama, you find that I'm moderating myself? Ni. You're fine, yeah, yeah. Okay, no question? Yes. Hello, hello. <laughs> Sorry. A very good morning to Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Rafida Aziz, and other distinguished guests. Before moving on with my questions, please let me introduce myself. I'm Rakesh Vira from Skola Sri Akma Secondary. Now let's move on to the questions. All of you in this hall would agree that we teens are offered, often referred to as Bakal Pemimpin Negara or the future leaders. Thus, so we are expected to improve our nation into a better country from every aspect. 
But with all the current turmoil going on, both in economic and education sectors, one of the obvious examples is the drastic changes in the education system. Since I am a product of that, I think I'm eligible to ask this. Be teenagers are somewhat being used as the guinea pigs to experiment all the new systems and syllabus before reconfirming them. Be teens are torn between it. So my question to the honorable speaker here, Tansri Rafida Aziz, is how do we react to this? What do we do? How do we deal with it? Seen so much pressure on we teens that we are confused on which path that we should take. Thank you. Anyone, anyone who plants in the minds of young people that you are the bakal pemimpin negara must be out of their minds. <laughs> there can only be one PM, one DPM, and how many cabinet ministers? The highest number was 36, as I recall. So make it 40, lah, yeah. After the 30 million, there'll be only 40 who be bakal pemimpin negara. Lah. Don't aspire to be. These, these fellows speak just like that, you know, without thinking. Planting minds of young people like you, I shall be pemimpin negara. I'll be so happy if you can pimpin yourself first. And then when you get married, you pimpin your wife and your family and your children, right? And then when you work, you pimpin your teammates. That will be your best service to the country. Leave the politicking to those who, you know, who know no better. I was not into politics. I was brought in. 24 hours notice where to do said. 24 hours notice. I had to come to this. What do I do, Uncle? Well, send your notice now. <laughs> Imagine. He called me in the house. I'm going to the government. I said, oh gosh. I knew I was already in politics, but I didn't think about being in government. You know, that's a life switch. I have to think. Do I last long? After what? Do the university accept me if I, after five years, I get kicked out? I don't know. But I lasted very long, but never mind. So, don't take to heart, you know, that call. You, pemimpin negara. Did I ever say you're going to be pemimpin negara? Did I ever use the word pemimpin? Did I? No, I don't even tell my children that. Why? Why should I plan into your heads early enough? You shall be the next pemimpin negara. Wow. As I've told you, be the best in your own circles of influence, remember? That's your biggest contribution. But unfortunately, too much has been planted. Bakal pemimpin negara. Everybody nak jadi pemimpin ni. Good Lord. Please, banish the thought. Be the best that you are. And as for guinea pigs, I tend to agree somewhat with you. But unfortunately, people don't learn. So maybe the universities, those of you who are in charge of students, do your own changes, lah. modify. Can mm. Only the Quran, you cannot modify. And the Bible and all the kitabs, you can modify. Can written those days, you can change. University strategies, you can change. Yes. Correct? Yes, yeah. undoubtedly. Yes. Uh, good. Change where you see changes are needed. So that you don't have this guinea pig syndrome. Of course, you're lucky lah, there were some things to guide you. In our days, we were under the colonial. It's what the British told us that we should learn, right? Tan Sri? Even our papers were marked in England. We had to wait three months to get our results. Yeah, all sent to England, you know. For economics, I finally was appointed the first chief examiner of economics for the country. Taking over from the Ramputi. Ah. Happy. <laughs> this was way back in 67. Finally, they decided a Malaysian should do it. Otherwise, the chief examiner was some or some putih somewhere. 67, yeah. Yeah, 67. I was pregnant <laughs> with my daughter. She was born in, in October 67. So I was about April, uh, March, right. you know. Right. Busy correcting and had, I don't know, 36 or 37. Uh, Examiners under right. me, you know, how many thousands to HSC, mind you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please, yeah? That end of story about being bakal pemimpin. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean it. You have your own circles of influence. Be the best that you are in that area. Yes. Don't try to be everything at the same time. Okay, next question. Right, yes, sir. Could you just identify yourself? Yes. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. Um, thank you for the amazing lecture. So I continue with my question. Um, I'm interested to know how did your personal education 
background shape your personality and traits today? Oh, my personal background? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. My personal background is a bit strange in the sense that my father was one of the first Malays, together with Tan Sri Haji Basi, the late, to be the first graduates of the Kerdang, uh, uh, Serdang Agriculture College. Now ah. it's University of Science. So my father was the first with Serdang. him, Malay graduates. It means now UPM, right? Now UPM. Yeah, lah. UPM, okay. yes, yes. But my father had the worst temper flashes. He could not stand orang putih telling him what to do. He could not stand the colonials, you know, belittling him or the country for that matter. And the moment the, the, they got out of line, so to speak, because they were orang putih, he just gave them 24 hour notice and resigned. So which meant that my childhood until to my teen years were actually like a roller coaster. When he got a job, it was one of the best jobs because he was qualified. Of course, if you resign 24 hours, end of story. Yes. And then you start all over again. So that taught me stability in life, so important. And to control your temper, because I am also his product. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Once in a while, I've done that. Take this bloody job. Sorry, my language. Took to the Prime Minister. I didn't ask for it. Take, take. You know, this handkerchief. I have a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also to understand that life is not always like that. It's got ups and downs. And you have to persevere. You have to make the best. When you are down, you're down. When you're poor, you're poor. It's not because there's nothing. Because it takes a while for him to get another job. Right? And uh, you have to suffer, you suffer. Silently. And you just support each other. If I had to go and sell nasi lemak and go to the cafeteria of the Gomba Home Guard, I do it every morning at 6, carry basket and send. Evening, balik sekolah, pukul 5.30, go and check how many nasi lemak sold. And count and take the money. Kalau tak habis, balik buat nasi goreng. I mean, you have to do that. And I was only a young girl. So in other words, hardship taught me that life doesn't come just like that on a plate, on a silver plate. You have to work hard. And my father and my mother, especially my late father, placed a premium on education. He would do anything to make sure we are all educated in the sense that went to school. Uh, if you want books, he can, he'll struggle to find books. But of course, I never bothered him. There's always a library. So I was a perpetual PR in the library. Because I can't afford to buy books. I can't, I can't be hounding him to buy books. So the library is my source of knowledge. I'll be spending time jotting down all the notes that I can. Of course, other friends can afford they buy books. They don't have to go to the library. I went to the library every day in the university. I was there every night. How would you think I get through my economics? So perseverance, hardship does uh, learn, uh, make you learn lessons in life. And so whether I have money, I don't have money, it didn't bother me. It doesn't bother me now. If I have money, I have a shukur for the Allah, you know. Almighty God, blessings. If I don't have money, well, it doesn't matter because I've had worse before. That's as simple as it is. I never wrote my, my biography because I can't be bothered. Right. Yep. But be the best that you can. I'll tell you this, how I, taught, I was taught by lessons by my own friends. When you live in Kuala Lumpur, you have friends whose fathers, you know, permanent in the same, because my father was not in the government service. As you know, he was at culture college, you know, so his would be the private sector kind of thing lah. Right. Where the orang putih is work, okay. And his last stint was in the information department. I don't know how he got there. But anyway, in Kelantan, he was uh, the director there. When you find that you're in school, mixing around with people who never knew hardship, so they were talking about, hey, uh, did you learn this uh, minuet? Uh, did you, did you just, uh, practice minuet? I was wondering, what's minuet? Allegro. They were actually talking about piano lessons. I have never even touched a piano in my life, you know. <laughs> and then somebody was talking about ballet. Okay. And then Hari Raya. I had to make do with a pair of shoes that cost $3, 3 ringgit. 
that can cover school as well as raya. Okay? So after raya, I came in my shoes with socks. And then my friend said, Ravida, where are your raya shoes? Because they're all displaying raya shoes, you know. I mean, you know, ch children, mom one, my raya shoes is this. My, uh, this is my raya shoes. Hey, that one is school shoes. Yeah, lad, my raya shoes are my school shoes. Ah, la, you, you don't want to show, you know, la, you know, they couldn't believe it. And in my heart, I cried. Because those were my school shoes and my raya shoes. So I tell myself, never mind. I'll study very hard. One day, I'll be able to buy lots of shoes. <laughs> so I've got a fetish for shoes. <laughs> my shoes may cost me 199 baht, which is 19 ringgit. I'll buy 10 at a shop. <laughs> it's only 190 ringgit. Your shoes are 250 each. I've got 10 shoes, 10 colors. <laughs> You know, my husband used to say, why? I, I tell him this story because in my heart, says, one day I'll tell myself I can afford the shoes. Of course not. Thousand dollar shoes. One nine nine baht in Bangkok. Right. In fact, my maid says, Kak Makcik, Jah punya kasut mahal pada Makcik ini. My maid call me Makcik. No, datin pun seri in my house. No, 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 Pakcik, Makcik. She told me, her shoes are more expensive than mine. Ya lah, Jah banyak duit. <laughs> Jokingly lah Makcik beli kat Bangkok And she's a Thai No To tell you That's it Hardship You appreciate the hardship You don't condemn the hardship You don't say What a life You know And blame your parents No You understand What it teaches you So that at the end Of the day Like I'm saying now I don't care I wear 199 butt blouses Nobody knows they don't believe it. How can it be? Yeah, this is 20 ringgit because the money depreciated, kan? <laughs> so what was 19 ringgit is now 20 ringgit. Yeah, 20 ringgit. I meet Malaysians in the shop in Platinum Mall. Eh, murah ya, Tan Sri. Ah, itulah tu, saya beli 10 ni, ha? Yes. Tahu 200. Ah, uh ah, -uh, murah, elok, you know, this. She couldn't believe. Yes. I said, why do you think I'm here? Buat apa yang nak bayar pula kat kedai tu RM200 uh, kan beli RM20 kat sini And kalau saya pakai tak sampai kaya pun yes. <laughs> Kan I swear on the Quran Mengata RM20 tak percaya lah Tak korang lah <laughs> What should I bother So in other words your values No longer being tied to anything That's uh, you know That's good only You You take both Ends of the spectrum that's what I mean. In summary, my life, yes. what taught me. Yes. And be right. Speak what is right. right. And no malice. I would like to tell you, malice is like cancer. Malice is like poison. Malice is like you dengki ke orang. You, you, you don't ever. If he has more than you, she has more than you, that's her as a key. Don't, don't have malice When you talk about something without malice Maknanya don't touch the person's heart right. That is my belief No malice You can do to me, I don't care You can assassinate me politically By spreading all kinds of vicious rumours I condemn you under my breath I curse you under my breath Without the pun you, inside me And I tell God Almighty Please, tolonglah balas I am not in a position to do it that's all. Yes. And I go and sleep happy. Yes. Right? Yes. Be right. happy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next, Next one. Next question. Yes. Madam. Yeah. Um, Assalamualaikum and good morning. Good morning. Um, firstly, thank you for giving me the chance to ask these questions. Um, well, I'm going to ask a very, very short and simple question, which is... Can you identify yourself, please? Sorry. Um, sorry. My name is Nick Misha Bitti Nick Mazlan, and I am, I am from Pusat Asasi Science, University Melaya. And I want to ask, what do you think about the change of PPSMI to MB, MMBI, where teachers are now teaching science and mathematics in Bahasa Melayu? So how can this change actually help the students nowadays? Thank you. I don't know. Lah. This flip-flops is giving me a lot of grey hair. <laughs> I think enough said. <laughs> Betul tak? Yes. I mean, why do we make language put at ransom? To the disadvantage of the young people. I mean, it's unfair to me. 
something that to me English should be learned so that whether you want to learn history, math, science or whatever, English is the medium of learning. All right. Medium of gaining knowledge because a lot of knowledge is in English. No time for translation. Eh? Anybody wants to translate, I think it takes two, two years to translate a book before it gets out of date. You baru dah start first print, dia dah out of date. Yes. Okay. That is not because medium of instruction must be English only, but our people, young people must be, must be taught English to enable them to communicate in anything in English. Right. To glean information and knowledge from anything that's in English. All right? And to also be able to express themselves in English. And if English is taught as a language, communications language, what is teaching and understanding maths or science or history or chemistry in English? Right. I hear that some teachers are teaching English like this. Benda murid, hari ini kita akan belajar past tense. <laughs> uh, hari ini kita akan uh, uh, bincangkan past participle. Hari ini uh, kita akan pergi kepada vocabulary. I mean, if you want to teach in English, you speak in English. Today, students, we shall sub talk about the subject past participle. Tada, the preempt, the, the apa namanya introduction is in Malay. All right. Macam mana? Yes, in pedagogy, actually, that's wrong. This teach, you can you can't teach language in another language. Exactly. Right. Yes. You want to teach? I right. I know I did French. From form three, sampai lah my university yes. as a degree. They they don't care whether you faham or not because they make total immersion, you know. First day they don't say good afternoon, tada. They terus in English, nganga in French, nganga mulut form three kat kampung mungkin anas. Blah 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 blah. They French. Blah, 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 blah. Of course they tahu kita tak faham lah. Then they go back to explain. Right. But the idea is if you want to learn. French, you cannot be taught French in English. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I have my five children, my grandchildren, who learn Mandarin. And obviously, they're teaching a Mandarin in their school was so good. They get A's for Mandarin. What? With all the little squibbles, you can A juga. Because obviously, the teaching yes. was total immersion. Okay. We have to learn total immersion in English. Those are two words I want to yes. for you to take back. Okay. Yes. Next <coughs> question, yes, madam. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, good morning to everybody in the hall. I am Nadia from the Faculty of Education. Uh, my question would be that why do you think uh, the Malaysian society as a whole, like you said, that lady who approached you at the hospital, she was just a teacher. Why do you think they do not value educators as much as they value for, say, um, engineers or doctors? Because frankly, it's quite demoralizing for us going through teacher, teacher training because we think we may not be as impactful towards the society as a whole, even though we are told otherwise. Thank you. It is our culture. I remember way back in the early 70s, I was in Sabah Berdam giving a talk to the people on cooperatives and, and economic uh, of co-ops. One, and then at that time, new economic policy had just been announced. So this man stood up and said, Yang Bawamad, masih senator lah dah kan? Rafida, saya ni guru cabuk aja. Wow, my ears bristled. Saya guru cabuk aja. Tapi saya inginlah nak menyambut seruan kerajaan. Nak memenuhi kota 30% bumi putera ni. Dalam perniagaan, dalam industri. Ha, ha, ha. He got... Two earfuls. How can, macam mana, cakap dengan you lah, macam mana saudara ni boleh anggap diri ni guru cabuk? Saya ni adalah hasil daripada guru-guru yang first class. Guru-guru yang faham macam mana nak ngajar kami. Inilah sebabnya saya dan rakan-rakan saya boleh jadi macam ni. Boleh jadi pensyarah pula akhirnya. Kalau letaklah kerana cikgu-cikgu guru yang dedikasi ni, saya rasa tak adalah ramai daripada kami di sini. Ni, government servant yang banyak ni semua ni. Jangan panggil diri guru cabuk seolah-olah jadi guru ni. Macam budak semalam lah, I told you. But ini dia kata, jangan jantan, lelaki. Malah kata lelaki, jantan. Guru cabuk dia kata. I said, 
Mak bapak di Sabak Bernam ni letakkan amanah pada saudara. Mengajar anak-anak dia. Kalau mak bapak ni tahu yang saudara menganggap diri guru cabut, mati dia tak hantar anak ke sekolah tu. On and on. And then I kata, ni nak sabut seruan kajian. Kita ni bukan sambut seruan kajian ni macam nak nangkap burung. Bunyi burung datang masuk masuk ke getah tu. Banyak caranya. Kalau saudara jadi guru gaji berapa? Seribu lima. Kenalah cari apa ni perniagaan yang boleh dapat pendapatan lebih daripada seribu lima kan? Janganlah kalau pendapatan terkurang daripada seribu lima sebab nak menuh kota, hutang berjela dekat bank. Ha, saya punya ceramah tu. Dialog. I don't care whether they like it or not. I have to drum it into their heads. But first of all, I take obje- objection to guru cabuk. Because I was a lecturer in university. And we are also guru actually. Ya, yes, exactly. Saya kata saya ni guru. Jauhkan Allah saya nak anggap diri saya guru cabut. Amanah tu punya tinggi ni. Ni ramai ni yang saya mengajar. Ni kalau salah saya, salah ajar. Anak murid saya yang seribu lebih tu. Tak ke mana hala je. Itu pun ajar betul-betul pun ada juga yang hala ke lain. Ha. Yelah yang macam susah nak ajar kan. Ha. So don't ever think. That's what I kata. If you are able to say that you are a leader in your own circles of influence, you never have inferiority complex. Never. Ini, saya ni tak ada benda, suri rumah aja. My God, that's even better. Kalau mak tak dapat ngajar anak, macam mana cikgu nak ngajar? Pada tan sampai ke cikgu anak dah pelesit. <laughs> You've already bred a devil. And then she gets to the school. And of course, I come to university, he's already a rogue. You expect Khadijah to teach her Oh, professor nak teach Betul tak? So, janganlah kata Alah, saya ni housewife je What? That is the most noble Dah lah awak punya husband sibuk They never say I'm only a husband Ada pernah dengar tak, man? Alah, I'm only a husband Ada? Only the men, the women in Fairy Complex. Ayah, I'm only a housewife. Eh, hey, without you, your children will be tumbang ambing, you know. Be the best housewife lah, be the best mother lah. So that your children come to school, the teachers, Alhamdulillah, I'm getting such good children. And not go home and cry. Oh my God, why do I have some placid in my school? <laughs> okay. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, yes please, yes sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Muhammad Salah Hassan. I am from as a master student from in Puma Public Policy. Uh, since I'm a student of public policy, what interests us uh, actually is uh, the issues in policies, the issues with the programs. My question is, uh, what do you think is the issue with the educational policy in Malaysia now? And what are the most important issues that should be addressed now in order for us, for Malaysia, to move toward a uh, developed nation. Thank I you so much. I just gave you some pointers just now, given the one hour that I was asked to discuss. Remember I told you about education? You bear in mind what's the environment that we're living in, global, regional, and domestic. Bear in mind that we're dealing with youth and what are their characteristics and expectations and demands. Then the education system and strategies must therefore be uh, to suit this environment and to suit the cohorts that we're dealing with. And I, I pointed out, I'm not going to repeat lah, sorry lah, you know, much as I'd love to, but no time. No, seriously. I gave you that. Remember, I said nation building. What does it mean? And then, youth, who are these people? What are their characteristics, right? Y and Z. And then, so how does, how does the education system and the strategies we adopt fit into these two? That's important. Yes. It's, incidentally, for those of you who are not aware, this lecture is available on YouTube. It's already broadcasted to YouTube and you can download this particular lecture if you want to replay the, yeah. the good, lecture. Good. Yes. Mm, thank you. At least I can hear myself maybe. <laughs> Actually, I don't like to hear myself. I speak too fast. Okay, any more? Yes, my name. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Kashin from... Um, education faculty. Uh, I would really like to ask, this is quite a personal question, where I, 
actually is um, more related to my uh, career. I just wanted to ask, how, have, how, how do you have that huge, I mean like the guts to change your career from a lecturer to a politician, you know? Yeah. No, no guts involved. Seriously. <laughs> Well, I was already in politics, right? I joined politics at 22 plus. Okay? Right. By 30, as you said, I was already a senator. That was time of Tun Razak, you see? Yes. Before I was a senator, Tun Razak appointed me to his economics bureau, where he asked me actually to do something with the smallholders. And I, as a university lecturer with no resources, actually did it on my own without a cent being spent to do a paper to suggest and propose that he set up RISDA. I even gave the name RISDA. Right. And then he appointed me the first board member of RISDA. So that was I and Tun Razak. And of course, he appointed me senator in 74. In 75, I already was a Supreme Council member. I was nominated. I didn't go campaign. Got no time. I got thousands of students who teach. You know, man at the time, three classes and, and uh, tutorials. You can, uh, no, no campaigning. You nominate me. Very good. Thank you very much. And now she's contesting. You want to vote, vote. Tanda tak apa. No skin on my back. I won. Second highest vote. Imagine. Why? Maybe they thought at, at that time, not few young people, few women, can, so they want to give a chance. These are people who thought that the country was worth more uh, than who individuals can. If they can contribute again. So when Tono Hussein, after taking over to Raza for his first cabinet, as you know, called me at 4 o'clock in, uh, in the afternoon while I was in my, on my sabbatical leave, to write up my PhD thesis, which I never finished, of course. Uh, called me at 4 o'clock and said, Rafida, as you know, I'm doing my cabinet, yes, Dato. I want to bring you in government. Bring me into government, yes. Uh, I want to make you sister parliament in the public enterprise, but I promise you, in one year, you will be a deputy minister. Well, he already made plans for me, you know, wow. And, oh, oh uh, okay, Dato, can I have some time to think and I tell you next week? No, 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 no. You tell me 8 o'clock tonight. You call me in my house. 8 o'clock, why? Because tomorrow I'm announcing it in the Spring Council. And I'm a member of Spring Council. Oh, uh, tonight, yes. 8 o'clock tonight, you tell me. Call my husband. My husband said, call Uncle Aziz. Call Uncle Aziz and ask me, what did Hussein say? Tell Hussein, Dato Hussein said this, this, this. Okay, he's a man of his word. Take the job. So, Uncle, what do I do? Yeah, send in your resignation now. <laughs> what choice do I have? This is public service. Come on. You know, public service, nih. talking about public service, this is a chance to be there. Not because it's going to be anything, you know, it's just a parliament. But the thing is that such a, a pleasure, such a gratitude that people see you as being able to contribute your little way. I accepted it. Next year, I was made Deputy Minister of Finance, which you didn't mention. Four years, I was Deputy Minister of Finance. Yep. Then seven years, Minister for Public Enterprises. And I found that the government was wasting money on 900 over companies. And I went with a dossier to Tun Hussein at that time, said, Dato, uh, this may be politically uh, not, not correct. It may have some repercussions on me and maybe on you as a, as a Prime Minister. But I'm closing down the bulk of these government companies. They're wasting money. The only things that were surviving were the SCDCs. There. Sadia was a SCDC officer. The SCDCs can take some of them. But these government-owned companies, cinema, halls, coffee house, wig imports, you tell me, what are we doing? <laughs> wow. So I said, Dato, these are the ni, 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 ni. Rafida, if it's good for the country, you do it. He didn't even bother to read because he knows when I give something, it's not willy-nilly, washy-washy, you know. If it's good for the country, you do it. I will support you. Wow. That's it. Before I left, the ministry was closed. Betul tak, Zadia? You don't need a ministry of Papali Enterprise. Enterprise belongs to private, private sector. sector yes. Government facilitates public, private sector. So it became entrepreneur development. Right. Now I don't know what it is now. <laughs> tak ada lah. Finish, finito. No more. Hmm, I don't recall what it is. Tak tahu lah, tak ada lah. Yes. Tak ada dah sadia kan? Ha, tak ada. Uh, I'm, I'm credited for closing down the ministry. You know, maknanya killing my own career lah. Yes. Tak apa. <laughs> 
What's more important, my career or any? But of course, at that time, you know, when you close it down, there were SEDCs to look after, so we went on. Move forward. Move forward. Take away all the rubbish and move forward so that they can concentrate on major things. That's how. And then after that, Mahadi came in. I was still part of the enterprise until he offered me the job meeting. Yes. That's it. Okay. So you talk about the personal guts. It's not a question of guts. It's the prime minister calls you in the house. It's such already calling you in the house is something you know. Yes. He could have his secretary would just say, "Come and see the prime minister." Kan? Yes, certain too, lah, kan? He calls you himself. I say, "Oh my, what a must be great, lah." Yes. That's how I felt. Yes. There's an honor already by itself. Yeah, it's an yes. honor, beyond yeah. honor. You're young. I was only 33. Right. 33 year old. You know who they are? They are giants yes. of independence, you know. Yes, yes. In the Supreme Council, who do I see? The ones who were there in London. And they were all my father's contemporaries. <laughs> And they always tell me, you know, kami panggil bapa awak tu Aziz Burma. I dare not go and ask my father why they call him Aziz Burma. Must be because he's built agaknya. I tak tahu. Ah, Kirin Salam, bapa awak ya. Okay, they're all together. Founder members of Pemuda Amno. Tuan Sadud lah, you name it. I sat there watching them. They all thought of me as their little daughter agaknya. It's such an honor to serve. Yes. That no no guts. It's here. I was blessed. To be able to serve. That's all again. I sacrificed my PhD, but thank you, lah. Uh, Nih University Malaya, you're giving me honorary doctorate. Yes, yes. <laughs> Finally. I'm very sorry. It took a long time. Finally. To I kept telling people, "You M, you got ready." No, they forgot about me. <laughs> Other university dah bagi dah. Utara, Selatan semua dah bagi. Right. Except University Malaya, my alma mater. Suddenly, you all remember. Thank you, lah. I think because my Facebook me. Suddenly, when my Facebook became alive, they all remember. Oh, she's still alive. <laughs> Very sorry about the oversight. No, no apologies. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, next question. But it's a pleasure. Yes. It's an honor for me to be getting yes. a PhD from you. Yes. Yes, madam. Yeah. Good morning, Tan Sri and distinguished guests. Um, I am Yumi from Cadet PDD, and on the role of education today, um, I have a question. The internet has become somehow of an unofficial educator for youths. I believe that uh, it, which is on the pendulum of both good and bad, because knowledge and information is so easily accessed, but at the same time it is unfiltered. So, uh, what do you think that? Um, I think education is education on appropriate internet usage and also social media etiquette is seems important but at the same time no one has given any emphasis on it so what do you think uh -huh. that goes my point about family nurturing and upbringing you don't need teachers and lecturers to tell you on the etiquette of uh, outsourcing or, or, or latching on to what is good or bad it should start in the family because families today which have children born literally with uh, handphones in their hands, right? Yeah? Uh, with what kind of mouse pad eh? uh, on their fingers. As long as they can sit up on the chair, dah pandai dah tekan. I know, I've got my grandchildren. Nine, ten year old already doing programming, you know. I don't know what they program. Pandai dah. Well, because the father is IT savvy. Who else do know? But the nurturing, not education. Please don't use the word education. Here is the nurturing. The nurturing from young. Okay, here is the iPad. Or here is whatever it is. You can only uh, plug in into this, 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 this. Then you block the rest. You can block, isn't it? Yes. Do not allow your child access into every expertise. Or... Allow them to access and sleep at three o'clock in the morning, talking to some pedophile at the end of the world. Because that child doesn't know he's a pedophile. Thinks he's a nice, handsome, fourteen-year-old boy. Actually, he's a fifty-year-old predator. Now you nurture. Don't wait for the schools to teach. Oh, for God's sake! Mak bapa ni kemana ni? Snoring away in the room. 
I've given you your iPad. I've given you iPhone. So no more. Don't bother me. I got work, you know. I'm CEO. And I, woman, want to fill a quota 30%. <laughs> quota fillers, right? So, that's where it starts. I'm telling you. It starts at home. I have children too. Right. My son at 14. My mistake. Because we gave him a computer, right? But you know, when you have gang together, come into the house, kan? That time you have jaring net. You remember jaring net? Yes. Ah, so via jaring net, you can get whatever, right? But it seems that if you can bypass jaring net, go to some other net from somewhere, you can get some content. Which, to them, Playboy was the idaman-idaman rupanya at that age. And the sisters squealed on him. Mommy, you know her. They all sit together in the room, you know what? They were looking at Playboy, center page. I mean, our age, I mean, it's nothing but to them. First time seeing the woman's body, you know, in color. <laughs> so one day, I called my mother, my late mother, Ma, come and sit here, see what Chuchu is doing. Okay, ask the son, you take out your computer, that time, big, fat computer lah, bukan small, small thing kan, you know, oh, first of generation. All right, now I want you to access the thing that you were accessing, Playboy. Mommy, do it now. Are you well, in protest? No protest. If you can watch it with your friends, I want to see it. <laughs> I want to see how you bypass the jaring net to come to this net. Okay, what? Of course, struggle lah. What? 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 The center page. My mother said, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Apa ni? Ah, mak ni lah dia. Dua, tiga hari kita tak tengok ni lah dia. Ah, from that on, he got a lecture of his life lah. <laughs> now that you seen the woman's body, ah, sudah. You're only 14 years old. You got no business looking at Playboy. Apa? This computer is meant for you to download things to add on to your education. I don't school them. I just school like that. I school as an adult, you know. No screaming around. Uh, your grandmother has seen what you can do. Okay, she understand. <laughs> of course, he was turning red. Or couldn't say anything when grandma was there. But he learned his lesson and never again, no. Never again. And now he's in IT business, doing proper business in Cambodia. Not here. Here, very hard to get business. Nanti orang kata pula, mak tolong. Ah, you know. However good you are, mak mesti tolong ni. Uh, so, you say, I better go abroad. Nobody tolong. For my own capabilities. Better lah, kan? Right. Now, I know my child. And I'm sure every child that was 14, now 10 years old dah pandai. Caya lah cakap saya. If you don't monitor your children at home, with a little iPhone, handphone ni, uh, you mark my words. Mark my words. So, he is careful with the children lah. Extra careful, I can see that. Right. Oh, very careful because he got his, his turn way, way back. It's nurturing, please, not education. At home. Okay? Right. Eh, ni kan ada bapak pun tengok. Macam mana? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, sir. Next question. Uh, yes. Sorry. Okay. okay um, good, yes. sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Tuan... Uh, uh, Tan Sri Afida and distinguished guest of honor. Tak apalah, stay away lah. <laughs> okay, my name is Kang. I'm from Cadet Novos PTD. Um, this question is a bit personal. I have two um, points to ask uh, Tan Sri. Okay, now Tan Sri, you mentioned that you have a... Wait, I'm looking at him. Oh my God, you are dead. <laughs> <laughs> I look, look at, at him and he was looking at him. No, I don't look at the screen. I want to look at a real person. <laughs> And I saw his mouth not moving. <laughs> okay, sorry. Dia bercakap tak pula. Sorry. Sorry to you. Okay, yeah. um, my, okay. Um, okay. I have two uh, points to raise. Um, the first thing, Tan Sui, you mentioned that you have something of a temper. And the question... Who doesn't? <laughs> okay, um, how do you manage your temper in an environment that's 
what I heard in Miti, it's quite hectic. So how do you manage your temper in a hectic environment? And a sec my, a, a, my second question is, um, what, Tan Sui, you mentioned that you had an unfinished business before you switched into politics. So during that time between unfinished your... Unfinished PhD. Yes, unfinished PhD, my apologies. Uh, so during that time, during that unfinished PhD, and when UM conferred the honorary um, PhD, um, how do you deal with... Okay, basically what I'm trying to ask is, how do you deal with disappointments in your life? Thank you. Well, first of all, don't get into a position where you will be disappointed. Uh, this is what I meant about being nurtured to rationalize, to analyze. Once you're able to rationalize, very, very seldom and rare you'll be disappointed. For example, if you, you set your expectations that high, when you know you rationalize, you say it's not possible, so you lower your expectation, you won't be disappointed, correct? As for not doing the PhD, that's not a disappointment. My goodness, being offered a job to serve in the, the country. Wow, it's worth 10 PhDs. Yes. Correct. To me lah, I don't know about other people. To me, it doesn't matter. It didn't make me any less of a Rafida without the PhD. Right? And then talking about hectic environment in Miti. I have a temper in the sense that I'm not your cool and calculated person. That's what I mean. I'm only human. You irritate me to the point, for example, you irritate me about my country, you will hear the worst of me. But I will not use swear words. But I will say in a way that made you learn a lesson. I tell you, I was in Bern during the height of the 1997 crisis. I was part and parcel of that little group with Tun Mahade that was struggling every day to revive this country. I had two weeks of non-stop meetings with hundreds and hundreds of private sector, small and big, to get feedback to see how we can help them. You know, they were really in dire straits. And just after that, after we had the capital controls all in place, I was in Bern, very big financial investment I mean, seminar. I spoke. At the dialogue session, I explained very detailed what we were doing to overcome the crisis. Our way, not conventional wisdom, remember? One editor of a very new influential newspaper stood up and his first words were, Madam, your country is worse than a pariah, pariah country. Your prime minister is worse than Saddam Hussein. And went on and on and on along those lines, using the word pariah for Malaysia. Oh, how many times I was patient. I listened. Have you finished, sir? Yeah. Please sit down. <laughs> and then I lashed out. You have never even been to my country, so don't talk about it. Secondly, I explained for one hour what we were doing. You can't get it into your head. You think that just because we are doing something non-conventional that we are wrong, we'll prove you wrong. I went on and on and on. So don't ever call my country a pariah country. Pariah lah. But they must say pariah. You know, they cannot say pariah. Pariah country. And I went on, on that note, you know. And the organizers apologized to me because they were shocked to see this man condemn me suddenly. He has never been to Malaysia. How can you even know? You, you read. Sources from don't know where condemning us. And now we were proven right. People are copying our way, right? I wish I could meet that man again, but I could be bothered. Lah. <laughs> now, that's what I mean by temper. But there is a limit to which my temper is triggered. Like my little kids, they climb the window, you know? The same son, climb window up and down. <laughs> he was maybe nine years old. Uh, stop climbing the window. You're going to break your leg. Of course, I turn my back and he's climbing the window, you know, trying to climb who's faster with the sister. <laughs> Call him down, pull him down, and gave him a whack on the feet. Because the climbing can, not the tangan, it's a feet. Whack. Cry. Okay, cry a few seconds. Okay, sit down. Do you know why I whacked you? No. <laughs> because you were climbing the window. That's a wrong. That's how I speak now. You show my heart, I, I, I control my temper. Because you're climbing the window. You climb the window, you make a mistake, you fall down, you break your leg. Now, do I care that you break your leg? I do, because I love you. 
If I don't love you, I couldn't be bothered. You is your leg, not mommy's leg, you know. You go to hospital, not mommy, you know. Broken bone, not mommy, you know. You're, but I love you. Mention the word love three, four times. <laughs> because I love you, I care for you. So therefore, you didn't listen to me, I have to smack you. So that's how I teach my children. But if I were to give vent to my temper, it's smack here, smack here, everywhere lah. <laughs> and scream to high heaven. And of course, they won't listen, right? They become immune to your shrill voices. Ah, that's all. In the ministry, the same thing. You know, with a kind of a warehouse and bench making, I have to restrain my temper. Of course, make a joke out of it. Nasib baik, tak ada O. Point is made, right? One of them, I tell you how. One of them, I'm talking about benchmarking ni. Must be standards of performance again. And the report came in such a substandard thing. I said, why are you presenting this kind of report? This one has to go to cabinet finally, you know. It is not the kind of work that we can accept from ET. And went on. So I explained. This page tak betul, tak betul, tak betul. Factually tak betul, analysis tak betul. You know, minister, the problem with you is your standard is too high. Because I, I told you I'm friends with my staff, right? So I allow them the freedom to interact with me. The problem, Minister, your standard is too high. And his colleagues look at him like, aha, we're going to watch them. <laughs> so I said, oh, did you say my standard is too high? All right, I have a table, okay? You're a golfer, right? I'm a golfer too. We're all golfers, okay. My standard, okay, golfing, this is pa, my table lah, pa. pa. Par four means par means you okay lah. My standard is kalau boleh eagle tau. Two under four. But birdie pun cukup lah my standard. Your standard kat mana? Ni. Three over. So don't talk about my standard being high. If I apply my standard to you, I don't even expect par. I expect birdie. You can't even give me par. So let's stop talking about my standards and your standards. This is not my standard. This is the nation's standards. They expect the best from us because you're not serving Rafida Aziz. You're serving the country. You see? That's how I, that's how I restrain my temper and yet the message gets through. I don't throw files. No, no, no. Because we are friends first. After that, we can, we can laugh at each other, you know. And then he will come and say, I'm so sorry lah, Datuk Sri, you know. It's okay, you learn your lesson, never say that again. <laughs> okay. I don't go screaming around people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, now you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, good afternoon, uh, Yang Berbagai Tang Sri and uh, Prof. Wawang. I'm Zugindran, uh, ex-student of University of Malaya. I have one question. Okay, uh, Tang Sri has mentioned that... Um, uh, education shouldn't be politicalized and um, politicalized. Politicized. Sorry. Right. <laughs> and um, what is your stand on equal open opportunity on in education, uh, locally and also internationally? Thank you. You know, like healthcare, education is one thing that that, that should have access to all, right? That is why I said. When you look at the structure of education, the government must try to minimize the disparities that exist among schools in this country. I gave you an idea of rural schools, urban schools. Rural school, it does not matter, sekolah kebangsaan ke, sekolah Tamil ke, sekolah Cina. They are all equally of lower, upper, you not say standard, but in terms of infrastructure. Much lower there than compared to urban schools. I pity them. I pity them, you know. Where here, everybody has a computer, they only one computer. They got to lock it up. Tu. To show me the computer can buka cupboard, lock up. Because students have the computer, kan? so there's only source. I'm talking about some back water, my kawasan. So, you know that there is a disparity. This has to be acknowledged. Then you can have better access. I know, the Gandhi Memorial. You can ask the MIC there. I have to raise money to make sure that school has infrastructure to make sure the students who go there and the teachers who teach there, including Malay teachers, are able to teach in an environment that is motivating them to improve, right? Like this Chinese school that I talked about, the Chungwa, where condemned by JKR and no bothered. 
Why should they call you condemn? You replace lah. Condemn the building and then you allow people to be still there. I don't want to be responsible. So I have to raise money. Nasib baik lah ada enough people in this country who see education as worth investing in. But others elsewhere in town, they don't need it. You know, it's like automatic je. I don't know why the disparity. But access to education, it should be to everybody. That's why those days, because the Malays couldn't come to secondary schools, we had the asrama concept. That's why. To take them out of the villages, go to nearest town, and then have the asrama there. Residential. That's why the idea, not to give them special treatment. These poor guys have to walk miles to go to school. That's why. The concept asrama those days. To give them that, that possibility of going to school. Otherwise, they never go to school. Like in Sabah, Sarawak now. They walk for miles. See? That's what I mean. Access is not education as such. So the infrastructure even. So this has to be looked at very seriously. The members of parliament must take a, a role in, have a role in this. Not go and play politics with education. Okay. Yeah? Thanks. All right. See. Okay. We have, uh, we have time for one last question now. It's almost uh, 12.30 now. Yes, madam. Okay, two last questions. After that, I think we have, we have uh, to ladies stop first, here. Ladies yes, first. Yes, ladies first. Yes, madam. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a very good morning to uh, Yang Bragia, Tan Sri Rafida Adis, and all the audience here. I'm actually Li Meiyan from Faculty of Education. So actually, I just want to share a topic and asking for the opinions. Like, um, since I'm from Faculty of Education, so I, there's a high possibility that I will become an educator in the future. So um, how should I treat my children if, when I, for example, if I become a teacher in secondary school, and as, uh, when my children grow up and it happened to be my own student, so I mean, how should I treat my own children that is also my students? Is it should be the same as the other students? Of or? course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Treat them as students. Forget that they're your children. And okay. they they misbehave, you also teach them how to behave. They should be told that, look, just because I'm your teacher, don't take advantage. Huh? Don't be mengada-ngada. Huh? Just because mommy is teaching, you want to be extra naughty, teach them at home first. Tell them at home first so that they're not, you know, hey, my mother, you know, don't play the fool. Huh? <laughs> She's my mother, you know, they might do that. You may not, they might, you know what I mean, children? Okay. You know, being children. So, nurture them at home first. You might end up one day in my class, but I teach you no know, differently because a student is a student. There's no place for cronyism anywhere. That's so my, my standard. That's what I said. I have my classmates, I have my students who are my officers. They are all friends to me. And I always come to privately tell them, look, you may be classmates, but please, lah, this has got nothing to do with classmates. You know, this has got to do with work. Ah, you know? Okay. Thank oh, you. Thank teach you. them as a student. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, there's a last question. Yeah? Okay. Good morning. Uh, honor, honorable guest, okay. ladies and gentlemen. No more honorable. I uh, miss already. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I'm Alexander from China. I'm from Faculty of Language Linguistics. You know, today's topic is the role of education in the nation building. I just heard something from very famous experts in the international conference. He mentioned that the ultim ultimate goal of education is just to make every student to educate themselves. That's, that means that our students must have the motivation to learn. The, they, they are not forced to study. They like the interest. They have the interest to study. So my question is that in the next 20 years or even 50 years, how can all the educationists, all the educational policy makers do to make self-education become reality? Thank you. Well, I do believe that in a world where you need to intermingle and communicate with the rest of the human beings, self-education throughout your life will end up like a caveman. You may not know what's happening around you. You're just busy educating yourself. That's why we have a school system, you know, where you group together people to learn, to up nurturing. Remember, I told you nurturing. Not just to learn, but to be nurtured in socialization, respecting diversities and so on. That does not mean that you cannot on your own add on to knowledge. That's what we all are doing, you know, on an everyday basis, even me. 
I'm chairman of this company and that company. I got to learn, man. I'm chairman of a steel company. I'm chairman of an airline company. I'm chairman of Pinewood Studios. And Michelle Yeoh is a board member. Uh, the, yeah, the, the actress. And I'm chairman of a glove corporation. Glove. I have to switch my mind. I don't know anything about all these things before, let alone flying. So I have to learn. At 70 plus, I have to learn about the aviation industry, about the glove making industry, about film studios. So self learning. Nobody's going to teach me. My CEO is also learning. So. I agree, self-education, it is not the sole idea, but it is to complement what you already get through the formal system. I don't think the future schools will go out of fashion. If anything, that will change in terms of schools become a nurturing uh, apa namanya, uh, structure, not just education per se, because education, like you rightly said, can be achieved. The nurturing, that's why I always emphasize the nurturing. It is the nurturing that's important now. You can learn anything on your own, right? right? The nurturing is you cannot learn by yourself. It's got to be taught by group interaction, by your family interaction. Yeah? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. All right. I think uh, I'm sure all of you agree that we had a very interesting and a very lively discussion this morning with Tansri Rafida Aziz. And if the... Uh, if there's anything, perhaps Tansri, what would be your main uh, take-home message from, uh, from this, this morning's talk? First of all, you all have your own circles of influence. Yeah, from this family right up to the wherever you are. Make sure you assume leadership. I don't say ro play a role. The words I never use is play a role. Too many role players in this world already. They're all becoming, uh, you know, mini actresses and actors. All not assuming roles with responsibility, playing roles. So assume your roles in your circles have influenced well, so that you are able to either be examples, good examples to others around you, or you assume the leadership role that can motivate people to become better. And of course, we talk about education, it should include a good component of nurturing. Yes. To my mind now, nation building is not so much about education per se, academics, but nurturing. Because I've said it's good to have all the infrastructure, the physical, but if the people are not geared to nation building, no point. No point. You yes. may get all the 12 A's, but you're antisocial. What's the point? You may get first, eight, first, upper first class degree in whatever, yes. and you are really anti everything. What's the point? Yes. All right. Right? Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Tanshri Rafid Aziz, for a most uh, lively discussion and public lecture too. Thank you very much, Tansri. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tansri Rapida Aziz and Prof Awang. I would like to request for Tansri Rapida to remain on stage while I invite Prof Awang to present a token of appreciation for Tansri Rapida Aziz. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of INPUMA, University of Malaya, I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to our speaker, Tansri Rafida Aziz, for making this auspicious event possible. We would also like to thank our distinguished guests in attendance, and finally, our sincere appreciation to the presence of all of you here. It is our hope that you have enjoyed today's lecture. I would, I would like to also record our appreciation to Associate Professor Dr. Yahya Ahmad, Dean of the Faculty of Built Environment, for allowing us to organize the lecture here in this beautiful auditorium. I must also thank Dr. Faisal Azli Muhammad Rahim, Deputy Dean Research and Development, and his team of dedicated staff for their support in ensuring the smooth implementation of today's program. We have come to the end of this program. At this point, I would like to invite everyone for lunch. For our distinguished guests, we will send an usher to escort you to the banquet room. And for UM students and other groups, I kindly ask for you to adjourn to level two of this building for lunch. With that, I thank you once again. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon.